November 1971. Six teenage students and their two leaders became stranded for two nights on the Cairngorm Plateau, one of the highest and most inhospitable places in Britain. Six of them died from exposure to blizzard, and the other two barely survived. Perhaps the worst of it all, it could have been prevented at each step as the tragedy was unfolding. As early as the 1950s, the Edinburgh education system recognized the value of outdoor activity training within schools as an opportunity for the students to expand their skills, and as such, dedicated centers were established. The Outdoor Pursuit Centre employed five permanent instructors, with four of them employed in various schools in Scotland. One of the instructors was William Ben Beattie, who was assigned as an outdoor education instructor within Ainsley Park Secondary School in 1970. Ben was 22 when he started working at the school, and despite his young age he brought with him vast experience, knowledge and qualifications as a mountaineer and outdoors instructor. The Ainsley Park School was already accustomed to outdoor education, even before his appointment, but Ben took it to the next level by forming a mountaineering club. The club members would meet once a week and every other weekend, acquiring theoretical and practical mountaineering skills along the way. By November 1971, inspired by Ben's leadership, many of the student members had reached a comfortable level of outdoor skill proficiency, including mountain ascents in different weather conditions, as well as extensive rock climbing. The fatal weekend trip was designed as an extension to the experience the students were gaining from the club. The scope of the expedition was for the participants to practice advanced navigation and bivouac techniques at the challenging location of Cairngorm Plateau. Bivouac is essentially a temporary camp without tents or cover, usually used by soldiers or mountaineers. Now the Scottish mountain range of Cairngorms has its own volatile weather personality. According to experts, the climate there can only be described as subarctic. It features the highest, coldest and snowiest plateaus in the British Isles and are home to five of the six highest mountains in Scotland. Cairngorms reflect the most challenging area in the UK that can test even the most experienced mountaineers, especially during the winter season, let alone a group of teenagers aged 14 to 18 who lacked any experience to respond to atrocious conditions that can rapidly escalate. Ben was in charge of the planning and appointed his girlfriend Catherine Jane Davidson as an assistant leader. Three years his junior, in 1971 Catherine was a final year physical education student and often joined Ben on his outdoor adventures. She overall had advanced mountaineering experience and had been on the Cairngorms during the winter weather three times prior to the fatal accident. She was to obtain her mountaineering instructor certificate in the months to follow, but even without it she was regularly involved as an assistant to many mountaineering club meetings and outings. In fact, she was listed as an assistant member of staff on the November outing documentation given to the parents, despite not being employed by the Edinburgh Council or the school. 18-year-old Sheila Elaine Sunderland, a short-term volunteer trainee instructor at Lagania Outdoor Center, was also assigned as an assistant leader to the trip. Sheila lacked experience in the Cairngorms, but her enthusiasm convinced the principal of Lagania Centre to allow her to join the group. The student participants were a 14-year-old boy, four boys and six girls between 15 and 16 years old, and three boys 18 years old. The students were divided into two groups. The more experienced students would be led by Ben, and were to take a longer and more challenging route, while the less skilled students would follow Sheila and Catherine's lead on a less challenging path. The original plan was to issue their equipment on Friday from the Lagania Center and spend the night there. On Saturday early morning, they would set off to cross the Cairngorm Plateau through the summits of Cairngorm and Ben Macdui, 
and then descend to Korobothi, where they would spend the night. The distance for the outward trip was 13 kilometers and was estimated to take them around 6 hours and 15 minutes, excluding any breaks along the way. Their return journey on Sunday would have Ben's group to return via the summits of Kern Tau and Breriach, whereas Catherine's group would take a more direct route along the Larry Crew. The two teams would eventually meet at Rothier Murchis Hut at 4 p.m. With the skiing community expanding in the Cairngorms in the 1960s, three bothies, including St. Valerie's Refuge and Kern Bothy, were built to provide emergency shelter for skiers and mountaineers caught in bad weather on the plateau. Despite concerns raised about the dangers of bothies attracting more and more inexperienced outdoor enthusiasts, no action was taken back then. As a result, hikers and campers continued to include these bothies in their plans as an emergency backup. And this is precisely what happened in this situation. Depending on the weather and ground conditions, an emergency contingency plan was devised by Ben for the two groups to cut their trip short on Saturday and spend the night at the current Bothy on the current Gone Plateau, followed by a simple return through the Larry Grew and Sinclair Hat the next day. The whole plan, including the distance, the group split into two units and two unqualified instructors leading the wicker group and the emergency alternative plan had been approved in advance by the head of Lagaña Center, who had the power to veto unsuitable expeditions if these were deemed dangerous to the participants. The students left the school with Ben and Catherine at 6 p.m. on a minibus. Their departure was initially planned to be at 5 p.m., but Ben arrived late at the school, which caused a delay. After two additional stops, the participants arrived at Lagaña Center at 10.15 p.m., much later than what was initially estimated. The original schedule for Friday evening was to issue and allocate equipment to each participant, but with their late arrival at the center, Ben and Catherine decided to postpone it for the next morning. All group members retired to bed after midnight. After having breakfast at 8 a.m., the whole group spent a substantial amount of time preparing for the expedition, which caused additional delay. They had to issue the equipment for each member, relay some final details, prepare food, and finally pack their rucksacks. By the time they finished, it was already 11 a.m., having only around five hours ahead as daylight to complete an over six-hour journey. The weather conditions were not on their side from the start. Heavy snow fell on the hills the days before their trip, and the weather forecast issued by the BBC at 7.55 a.m. on that Saturday displayed severe weather deterioration with very heavy snowfall accompanied by heavy winds. The two people who should have taken the weather conditions into serious consideration were the head of Lagaña and Ben. They had the authority to terminate the trip at any point based on the forecast. Sadly, they never did. Aftermath revelations had Ben justifying his lack of action on frequent inaccuracy of the national and BBC weather forecasts, especially in the area of Cairngorms. The combined party arrived at the Cairngorm car park at 11.20 a.m., but because they were running late, they changed their plans by taking the chairlift up to the restaurant on top. When they arrived at the chairlift, they were greeted with an additional reminder of the deteriorating weather forecast on the board, but this was yet again dismissed by the group leaders. Before they embarked on the journey, Ben unexpectedly transferred two 15-year-old boys from his group, William Kerr and Raymond Leslie, to Kathy's team and took aboard two of the less experienced members. But why did Ben suddenly take that action? It makes you wonder, did he have doubts from the onset for the wicker group's abilities to handle the shifting weather conditions? Either way, the group began their adventure unaware of the challenges that lay ahead. Ben and his team of eight children departed first. 
Catherine's team followed 20 minutes later. At this point, they had around four hours of daylight ahead. Between 1.30 and 2.30 p.m., the weather conditions worsened, with the wind lifting more snow, which obscured the visibility even further. By the time Ben's team reached Quar Domain, the increase in wind, soft snow, and deteriorating visibility inevitably forced him to implement the alternative route and headed for the current Bothy to spend the night. They managed to reach the Bothy at around 3.15 p.m. The door was jammed with snow and the team had to dig out to gain entry. Once inside, they took off their wet clothes and then started having a discussion as to the whereabouts of Catherine's team. Shouldn't they be arriving soon? Should they try to go out in the storm and find them? Ben, on the other hand, immediately dismissed the idea. He was certain that if Catherine would not manage to reach Curran Bothy, she would aim to take shelter at St. Valerie's refuge, and he felt confident that they were well equipped to survive the night. While Ben and his team were sheltered, Catherine's team was faced with the first of the many serious struggles. Catherine's team reached Quar Domain at around 3.30 p.m., but the weather took a turn for the worst by that time. Visibility worsened severely, and the snow on the ground deepened. Some of the girls started crying, and the whole group became fatigued and slowed down. They were losing more time, and with only 15 minutes left of daylight, Catherine realized she too had to abandon the original plan and take the emergency alternative one and redirected the team towards the current Bothy. With the group's endurance and morale diminishing, she decided to descend to the Valley of Fifth Bite. This route was a shorter distance to the current Bothy, and she assumed that the area would offer them more protection from the weather elements. Soon it was 4 p.m. It was dark. It was windy. The group was exhausted and their spirits deflated. They were a mere 600 meters away from the Bothy, but Catherine suddenly assumed that her exhausted group would not make it to the current Bothy, and also feared that the darkness and snow would prevent them from ever locating it. So she took the desperate decision to bivouac at Fifth Bite instead. Unbeknownst to her, the Fifth Bite was an area where snow accumulated heavily there. And what she also didn't realize was that the worst blizzard of winter was about to descend. The snow was too soft and powdery, so they couldn't build a shelter with it. They only managed to produce a semicircular wall of snow instead. Catherine instructed the team to remove their wet clothes and get into their sleeping bags, lie closely to each other, and tilt their heads towards the makeshift snow wall. Catherine tried to maintain good spirits by having the group sing and tell each other stories. But a significant weather shift occurred at 2 a.m., marked by heavy snowfall and intolerable winds that would last 32 hours. The blizzard rapidly covered all of them with snow that threatened to bury them. They were suffocating as snow fell in their faces. Panic started to set in, and all children were screaming. Catherine and Sheila got out of their backs and began digging the snow away from their face with their hands, but Catherine lost her gloves in the process and was forced to dig with her bare hands. As the snow drew heavier, Catherine told them to kick the piling snow with their legs as much as they could. With their bodies getting tired, the snow was covering them faster and stronger. They barely made the night. Ben and his team awoke in a safe and warmer environment at around 8 a.m. They had to push the door open as it was covered with snow. It crossed Ben's mind to follow the route they came from and meet the other team, but then altered the plans as he was certain that they were probably ahead of them and the weather was too unsafe to risk his group by going back. Their descent was slow and complicated but with much effort and teamwork, they managed to arrive at Sinclair Hat at around 3 p.m. and then headed for the meeting point at Rothia Murch's Hat. By that time, it was already dark. When they couldn't find the other team, Ben called the Lagania Center and was informed that Catherine's team never arrived that day. 
Ben took the Lagaña principal and they drove to the car park, but after 10 minutes they realized they should go get help and drove to the Glenmore Lodge to inform the rescue teams there. At daybreak on Sunday, the situation had become dire for the group. Raymond Leslie was buried under the snow, but his voice could still be heard. Two of the girls had been forced out of their sleeping and polythene bags and were lying on the surface, freezing. Catherine managed to get the girls back into the sleeping bags, but realized that help was urgently needed. Sheila was unable to move, but William Kerr, who appeared to still hold strong, accompanied Catherine in their attempts to go find help. However, their efforts had to be abandoned after just 25 yards. They couldn't move far. The snow was thigh deep and the strong winds made any progress impossible. As they trudged back to the bivouac, the realization of their situation set in. With every passing hour, more members of the group became increasingly buried under the snow and delirium began to set in. As the night fell, Catherine saw flares in the sky, but their own mini flares were lost in the snow and they couldn't respond. The Glenmore Lodge immediately dispatched three teams of two men each. With Ben's suggestion, they headed to St. Valerie's Refuge in case Catherine decided it was too unsafe to leave and had her team stay there. However, the weather was so severe that despite their best efforts, the rescue team was unable to locate the shelter. By 1.30 in the morning, they found themselves battling for their own survival and had to seek shelter to endure the night. By dawn of Monday, Sheila and two other girls were already unconscious. Catherine tried to get up for help, but was too weak and dizzy, so she started crawling towards Cairngorm Summit. She was eventually found by rescue helicopter at 10.30 a.m. She was close to total collapse and a state of advanced hypothermia that took 10 weeks for her to fully recover. Although she was confused and barely able to speak, she managed to let the rescuers know that the rest of the party was close where she had been rescued. After harrowing efforts, battling with waist-deep snow, the rescue team and police came upon a distressing scene. They found the children at around 12.30 p.m. buried under more than 60 centimeters of snow where the doctor within the team was unable to find any signs of life for the six teenagers. Sheila Sunderland, Carol Beatram, Susan Byron, Lorraine Dick, William Kern and Diane Dungeon all terribly and unjustly died from exposure to the harsh weather elements. The last child to be found was Raymond Leslie who was buried under four feet of level snow and appeared to have a small snow cave formed around his head. Luckily, he was alive with a weak irregular pulse and appeared to be in a hypothermic coma. After harrowing efforts, they managed to fly him to the hospital where he subsequently recovered. The atrocious weather conditions had men on the ground and air unable to evacuate the bodies that day and brought them down the next day. That their efforts were heroic is an understatement. They were faced with an impossible life-threatening mission and a tragic outcome. Many of the fatal errors were uncovered during the fatal accident inquiry held in February 1972, where the majority of the evidence centered around the planning, various misjudgments and the level of appropriateness of such school expeditions. It was very apparent early on that the children were physically and mentally too young and inexperienced to take upon such a demanding expedition, and the whole plan from its conceiving to the fatal outcome was full of additional errors and bad decisions. To start with, the members were erroneously split into two groups, and the weaker group that needed the most care for was instead led by unqualified and inexperienced leaders. Since they were heading towards the same direction on Saturday, why not all function as one unit with Ben's leadership? especially since the weather forecast had a deteriorating projection. Ben undoubtedly felt hesitant for the weaker group's abilities, evident from him amending the group dynamics by adding two boys from his team, one of which sadly lost his life. 
Since he decided to overlook the weather forecast, he should have at least taken control of the less experienced group that required more support and guidance. The principal of Lagaña raised the point that he trusted Ben's words when told that the two groups intended to unite under any threat of safety, and that he would never approve if this was not in their plans. Was there ever such intention to reunite? During the trip, Ben was certain that the weaker group took an alternate option to shelter at St. Valerie's Refuge, which could suggest that they were not functioning as one group split into two, but as two independent units, with each leader making their own judgments, decisions and adjustments. And this could be supported by the fact that Ben's group had a 20-minute head start and why he eventually dismissed the idea to return to find the other group on Saturday when his group members suggested that. Failure to issue equipment on Friday instituted a sequence of delays that impacted enormously to the tragedy. They also slept late on Friday evening, which meant that they were not adequately rested. It took a considerable amount of time to issue equipment the next day, had Catherine's group started their journey as planned, they would most probably make it to Kurambothi. The rucksack itself was a hazard, as each child was carrying at least 10 kilograms on their backs throughout the trip. That weight is a lot for young people, and inevitably it contributed further to their exhaustion. The new time of arrival to their original destination was not factored in by Ben, which was a major oversight and he should regard the hours of daylight left and the weather conditions. During the inquiry, Catherine was criticized for many erroneous decisions. Firstly, as to why she did not attempt to retreat as soon as the weather evolved to an impossible to navigate in. Secondly, why she did not push a bit further to reach the current Bothy and instead opted to bivouac at a heavy snowside area. Her statement defended her decision as the only option available, as it was dark and the group did not seem to tolerate going any further. When the snow was heavily burying and suffocating her group, she repeatedly advised them to kick their legs to remain on the surface, and when they got tired she tried to unbury them herself. To try and keep them on the surface was a fatal mistake. Being on the surface exposing them to the icy wind which sweeps away vital body heat quicker, increases the chances to freeze to death. Raymond Leslie, the only child who survived, was buried deep in the snow and surrendered to it early on, which evidently insulated his body heat significantly. Could the children's panic and screams blindsided her judgment? The inquiry also revealed allegations as to the lack of proper notification of the participants' parents. The consent forms provided to them by the school were just a standard consent form that failed to specifically mention any winter mountaineering in the Cairngorms. Most parents were under the impression that the weekend involved hill walking, but nowhere near such unsafe weather conditions. Raymond Leslie's father even pointed out that when he heard the news on the radio, it never crossed his mind that his son was in danger, because he wasn't aware that Raymond was taking a trip to the Cairngorms. The capacity of trust and independence Ben had, that was not appropriately managed by his superiors and the school itself, is certainly a huge contributing factor to the fatalities. He had the freedom to decide, plan and execute his ideas without much guidance, supervision and management of decision-making. At the end, a formal verdict was returned on the six deaths, and no blame was appointed to anyone. The jury did not want to discourage future adventures, and instead made several recommendations, including assessment of fitness levels of the participants, more detailed information to be provided to the parents for outdoor expeditions, stringent requirements of instructor qualifications, assessment of proposed expedition paths, suggestion for destroying the bothies, and high praise on the rescuers who risk their lives. <laughs>